everybody. Thank you. Need this guy, I guess. Hey, everybody. It's, um, picture. <laughs> Awesome. Yeah, I do have slides prepared, I promise. <laughs> so anyways, uh, I'm Richard Wartell, or Wartortel, um, and I'm going to give a talk mostly on APT malware, kind of some of the things that we see out there, and just kind of to give you an idea of what's really out there versus what like the media makes APT malware look like. So we'll, I'll give you a little bio about myself, then we'll uh, see how you ever been so far as to have known what and how the being of APTs are. <laughs> and we'll have a little story time. And then we'll talk about a little bit about like the ways that uh, malware authors can do better and some of the ones that do. And then some of the ways that they can really do better. And then we'll end with Thug Life, because why not? So you may be wondering, what's a war tortel? That's a war tortel, apparently. I, I had a friend of mine draw my spirit animal, and that's what I got. So. <laughs> Apparently, I ride rapid ash and shoot rainbows, but um, so anyways, uh, I work for Palo Alto Networks. I'm a reverse engineer for a new um, research team there, I'm doing some really cool stuff. So um, I also write CTF challenges. Um, if you haven't had enough of a push, go do the CTF. Um, I wrote some of the reversing challenges for that. It's a great uh, CTF, and go do it. So let's talk about APT. Um, APT is this big buzzword that everybody in this room probably hates me for saying over and over again in this talk. But I'm going to say it a lot, and I apologize. So anyways, APT has this just huge thing behind it right now in the media. So if you Google APT, that's what you get. Like Google image search, you will actually get this image for APT. So APT is apparently ninjas in the, in the bits stealing the credit cards, according to images in Google. <laughs> But what really happened was some guy out there at some point wrote a regex that looks something like this. And basically, this is just a regex for going and finding credit card numbers. And I'm sure you've all heard about like Target and Home Depot. Um, this is like the kind of regex that's sitting in a piece of malware. And somebody wrote this, and then Target and Home Depot went crazy in terms of the media. And then all of a sudden, the media went like, oh, God. the." Hackers out there are basically like ninjas riding T-Rexes, flying through the Gibson, reading all the Matrix code so that they can make Terminators and take over the world. <laughs> like that, that was just like the explosion of things that happened because of like Target and Home Depot. And that's really not what's going on out there. Like this is hugely exaggerated by a lot of people that probably don't really know what's happening. So. This is more what's actually happening out there. This is probably more what an APT group looks like. Apparently, they code shirtless sometimes as well. <laughs> so anyways, APT has a lot of different skill sets. So there's you know, just script kitties out there that are copying and pasting code and just using this code that they find. There's small groups that are working together to you know, achieve some goal. And then there's like government-backed units. I'm sure everybody read like Mandiant's APT1 report and all of that kind of stuff. So there are nation states that are technically APTs. There's a lot of different definitions for this. So um, The motivations vary. Some people are out there trying to get intellectual property. They're trying to steal it from companies. Um, there are some uh, APT groups that are just doing recon. They just need to find out like who their mole is or something along those lines. And sometimes it's stuff like PCI fraud, like um, with Target and Home Depot. And then their programmers vary. Like I said, some are just copying and pasting code and probably don't actually know how to code. Um, some of them are writing packed kernel drivers. Like there are people that all the way on both ends of the spectrum in terms of good programmers. So I just want to emphasize that sometimes APT looks like this, and sometimes APT looks like this. And according to movies, sometimes APT looks like this now too. So. <laughs> So maybe what we need to do is rather than calling it advanced persistent threat, maybe we switch it off and say, let's call it persistent threat actors. The advanced part, that's negotiable sometimes. But this is just my little rant, and we'll move on to story time. So let's have a little story. Every story needs characters, right? So this is Fran. Fran works for the APTs. She's, you know, normal person, doing her job. She's just like any dev out there that's got a job and a boss and she's got deadlines and her own list of things she's worried about. So just a normal dev out there, but you know, she works for the APTs basically. So this is Barb. 
Barb's a reverse engineer. She works for like an IR company and she does reverse engineering for them. You know, when malware comes in, she's the one that actually reverses it. And then this is Taylor. <laughs> Taylor is Fran's boss. And Taylor, you know, can kind of be a dick sometimes and comes down on Fran's like, we need to do stuff now, got to get things done. So just, you know, your everyday group of people. <laughs> so Fran gets a call one morning and it's Taylor and Taylor's pissed. <laughs> Taylor's like, we need to be in this construction company so fast, please. Like, we need to hack all the things in there, and we need to drop all the back doors, and we need to steal all of their IP, like, yesterday. And Fran's like, okay, all right, let me think about this. She sits down and starts working at, at like, going through, okay, how can, we, how can we accomplish this? And, you know, she's got her own things that she's worried about, like, her kid that she's trying to feed, and, like, her family that has lots of pillow fights and like that boat that she wants to own eventually. So, you know, she's just normal dev working a job so that they can, she can make, her, make some money. So she works through all of this stuff and finally um, she's like, okay, what I'm gonna do is there's this public tool, I'm gonna use it, it's a back door, it's a rat, I can just drop this in there and I can reuse what they've already created for me so I don't have to reinvent the wheel. And she does this, it takes her like a day because somebody's already done all the work for her and she's like, yes, got it. She takes it, she sticks it into a PDF that looks something like this. Not an exaggeration, I've seen PDFs that look like this. <laughs> and then she's like, yes, nailed it, I'm really good at my job. They deploy it, they pew pew it out to all of the you know, servers for this construction company. And yeah, so that job done. However, the construction company gets a notification from the FBI or something like that and they're like, hey, yeah, something fishy is happening here, you need to check this out. And they uh, have a crappy internal team or they don't know how to handle it, so they hire Barb's company. This is pretty common. So Barb is here. She gets handed this piece of malware after they do a little investigating and they find it. And so she has her morning coffee and she gets to work. So she starts reversing this piece of malware and she sees things that r immediately jump out to her, the stuff that like, is really obvious and she's seen before. Like there's some ver very obvious artifacts that are left behind by this tool set called Poison Ivy <laughs> that Fran has decided to use. She's like, oh, I know this. And she writes something in a software that looks terrible like this and puts together an IOC and deploys it and is like, all right, done, nailed it. It gets deployed, they sweep, they get Fran, they get Fran and Taylor knocked out of it. So Taylor's pissed, obviously, you know. This is the, what they need, they need the IP from this place, so she comes down on Fran, like, come on, we need to get in there, you keep messing up, do this. And Fran's like, oh, I'm sorry, but I'll, I'll think really hard and I'll come up with something better. So she starts writing something better, she's like, all right, maybe I shouldn't have used Poison Ivy, maybe I should put something together myself. So she actually starts writing malware. And it gets back to Barb, and Barb starts reversing it, and this is what she sees. She runs it in a VM, and it prints out its own usage for her. <laughs> Barb says, lol. <laughs> She's like, thanks for telling me exactly what your malware does. That was really nice of you. And they do the exact same thing, write an ILC, do whatever they need to push it out, and they get Fran and Taylor knocked out again. So Taylor's pissed again. This keeps happening with Fran, can't rely. And Fran's scared, you know, she has her kid and her boat and all of these things that she's worried about. But she's like, all right, I can do better, I can do better. And she starts working again, and it gets back to Barb again. And this is what Barb sees. The malware drops this text file. So what the malware is doing, Fran has left all of her debugging inside of her malware. So every time it runs, it says, okay, well, at this point, I need this text file. So like when it was crashing when I was writing it, um, I need to know exactly what happened. <laughs> so she's left all of that in there and it basically set, tells, gives like a, kind of like a small little thing for you to read of exactly what this malware is doing as it's working through. So she's basically just commented everything for, uh, for Barb again. So Barb says, lols, like this is great. Her job is really easy right now because Fran's kind of doing all the work for her. And they do the same thing. Um, she also sees something pretty awesome in here. So she sees C2 communication like to, the, um, to Fran's server. However, they, what Fran is doing is she's encrypting the C2 communication and then she's compressing it. Does anybody see a problem with that? Yes. 
So if you take your C2 communication and you encrypt it, it becomes really high entropy. So it's just very randomized looking. Compression algorithms look for patterns and that's what they rely on. So when you have really high entropy data, compression will do nothing. So Fran obviously doesn't know what she's doing with this. So Barb goes out for a drink because she's done her job for the day. And she's like, yes, nailed it. Goes out with her coworkers that apparently work on Mars. And uh, yeah, so Barb's having a great day. Uh, Taylor's pissed again, just yelling at Barb nonstop. Barb's scared, doesn't know what to do, but she's like, okay. I, uh, oh, sorry, Fran is scared, doesn't know what to do. And she's like, all right, I can do this. I'm going to actually write some really good malware. And she really like cracks down and is like, all right, I'm going to do something good now. And gets back to Barb, and this is what Barb sees. Fran's gone through and deleted all of her debugging strings. Well, she hasn't really deleted them. She's taken the printer function that she had in there before. And she's just nulled that out. So it's not actually printing now. But what it is doing is it's still commenting and keeping all of those strings inside the binary. So when Barb goes through and reverses it, she just sees like a fully commented binary. It's kind of just been marked up for her already and nice and pretty. So she once again doesn't have to do any work. Says lol again. This is great for her. And her boss high fives her because her boss is like, you're doing awesome. Like, way to go on all these. You're taking like minutes to handle all this stuff. And she goes out for a beer. However, on the other side of things, Taylor is really upset now. Like, this is, this is really getting bad. Yeah, I know. Oh, man. <laughs> so Taylor's upset. Fran is, like, terrified. She thinks she's going to lose her job. But she, she starts thinking, and she's like, OK, I got this. I know I have some clever ideas. I'm going to implement them. It'll take some time, but I'll actually do it. So she puts together something. She feels really good about it. And they deploy it again. So Barb gets it, <laughs> and what she sees is this. She sees a connection string that looks something like this, and there's a tiny little flaw in what Fran has done here. She's missed a space rather than just copying and pasting an user agent string to make it look like it's Firefox. She left out a space, and because of that, you can write a network signature for it because Firefox is always going to have that space, and this is not. So. Immediately, there's this giant flaw in it. Taylor's mad, and like, oh, it's not going well. Fran's scared once again, just keeps going. Uh, but she sits down, she thinks about it, and she puts something better together. And this is where Fran actually gets kind of clever. So what she does is she starts looking through, she makes her malware look through the, re the Windows registry. And it walks through, and it says, OK, look through here and find out what browser is installed. And then have all of the browser user agent strings inside of the malware and drop the correct one every time. So now she's actually using the exact correct user agent string, no matter what version of Firefox, Chrome, uh, and she's injecting into that. So great, like pretty solid malware, like doing some clever things to hide itself. However, Fran's made some more mistakes. So Fran has actually broken her ability to change the C2 configuration. So anytime she tries to change the C2 configuration, this malware is just going to break. So that was great. Barb says, lol, this is awesome for her. Just silliness that she can put on her like malware wall of shame. And then she looks a little closer, and she sees something really ridiculous. Does anybody know the first rule of crypto? <laughs> Did you say don't do it? <laughs> I disagree. <laughs> don't, don't, don't roll your own is what I was looking for there. <laughs> yeah. And that's exactly what Fran has done. Fran's actually gone and written her own uh, crypto. And it's broken. And uh, under certain circumstances, it's just going to break and not work. So this is just making Barb and all of her coworkers have all kinds of laughs. And then even better, this is where it gets really bad. Fran is actually taking her payload. And she, puts, she takes like a nice, benign-looking binary. And she's just catting her payload onto the end of it. And then that benign looking binary is going to say, OK, look through all the open file handles. Find me the one that is the size of this file, because we, she knows the size because she created it. She looks for that open file handle. And then she goes beyond the PE, uh, the actual PE file to what's catted onto the end. And then she says, OK, that's where my stuff is. Decode that. And that's where what we actually want to execute, because that's the evil stuff. That's the good stuff. So she puts that all together, and it works perfectly, but she does it against her first domain, which is evil.com. 
Then when she deploys, she changes that to superevil.com and forgets to change the size of the file that she's looking for that's now changed by five bytes because it's superevil.com. Oh, well, thank you, Google Core. Ah, I guess now I'm drinking. <laughs> so what's happened because of this is now every time that file runs, it's gonna be, gonna be looking for the exact file size of the old file rather than the new file size, and it's literally never going to find it. It's actually just gonna run and do nothing after they deploy it. So not only do they not have to knock them out again, their stuff is just not working now. So this is great, Barb is laughing. This is awesome. Taylor's really upset, like, just over and over and over again, Fran has let her down, and Fran's like, oh, I, I don't know what to do, and she ends up having to move, and that's the end for her. Like, loses her job and goes. Barb's like, yes, nailed it, did my job really well. So she goes and has a party with all of her friends. I don't have an elegant end for this story, so I'll take a small bow. <laughs> and a drink. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, it's worse. I don't have a daughter. <laughs> so uh, there's a great little side story of... Uh, my girlfriend hears me laughing really loud all the way across my apartment, comes running in, is like, what the hell is so funny? And she finds me on the ground of my office, like giggling and playing with Barbies. <laughs> and she literally got concerned and thought I was insane. But also, first time I've ever gotten to expense Barbies, so that was kind of cool. <laughs> I'm hoping there's a next time. <laughs> We'll see. I don't know if I have another story. <laughs> so anyways, next I want to talk about some of the better you know, pieces of APT malware that are out there. You know, There are groups that are doing really cool things and writing clever malware. So let's talk a little bit about those. First of all, I saw a sample that actually uh, implemented an entire shell inside of the sample. So most of the time when you're writing a piece of malware, um, show of hands, who knows what a reverse shell is? Yay, good. So. Most of the time, all you'll do is say, all right, it, take this command. If you, um, if you get this command, start up a reverse shell, and then you can take any command that you can run into, under a normal command prompt. So you can do, you know, look at network information that way. You can run net. You can do all these different things that way rather than having to implement them yourself. This one, they, it was an interesting engineering task. I mean, they had implemented every single, like, CD, like, um, Netcat was implemented inside of this. All of these different things were implemented as commands that the C2 would give it. So it was really impressive as an engineering feat. I remember writing a shell in operating systems class and it was a pain. So like putting that all together into an obfuscated malware, yeah, it sounds even worse. But they had done it and it was pretty awesome. So that was nice. I don't know what the point of it is. I would probably write the 20 lines it takes to write a reverse shell rather than doing that, but it was kind of cool. Um, I saw a piece of hybrid, or actually a coworker saw this, it was a piece of hybrid malware where what it was doing was it was checking segment registers. And then it looked like it had jumbled code, uh, like that it was jumping to jumbled code that would not actually execute, that would crash. But what it was doing was it was checking which architecture the, uh, the malware was running in, and then it had two shellcode payloads. One was 32-bit and the other one was 64-bit. And it was jumping to the one that actually fit the architecture. So it was kind of cool because it's a lot of work to write shellcode on its own, writing it in two different architectures and shoving it in a binary. It was pretty awesome. Um, this is one that I really liked. Uh, this is a piece of financial malware. Basically, it just looked like tons and tons of benign code. It, it looked completely legitimate, really hard to see anything bad there. Um, but we had a lead telling us, you know, this is malware. We're pretty damn sure. And what it actually was was it was building a bytecode buffer as it was executing all of this random benign stuff that didn't really do anything. And all that bytecode buffer do, did was deobfuscate itself. It had a bunch of levels of encoding. And then it would execute just a download and execute script. So it was just downloading something else. However, without actually pulling down what it was downloading, I couldn't get, I, I didn't know the actual functionality of the malware. So that was pretty nice. And um, their C2 was down by the time we got, it, uh, we got this. So, I still have no idea what the malware actually did. So that was a nice piece. Finally, um, one of my favorite things is malware that, or malware authors that will write code to write malware for them. Like, if you write something, if you have like a, 
a clever idea that you want to implement, you should write something that writes it for you if it's really difficult to write on your own. So if you want something that's randomized and difficult to work through, um, you can do that. And I ran into this recently. So what I saw is I, I started reversing a sample. There were no strings in the sample. Um, and as I like debugged it a little bit, I found that there were strings, but they were all encoded with this big encoder. And this is the this is the function graph for this encoder, um, and it was disgusting. And you don't actually see that there's calls in there as well. So it's not e it's more than just that. So if anybody has done any reversing, the uh, this is the output from hex rays for this. It's all just math, random math that made no sense. So like add, subtracts, XORs, um, doing bit manip single bit manipulations, all kinds of random stuff in there. If you were to actually physically write this and write something that could encode it and decode it, that would take a lot of time manually. So I'm, what I'm pretty sure happened here, and I, I don't have supporting evidence yet, but I think they basically wrote something to write malware for them. So they wrote something and said, okay, write a math function that's really hard and complex and does a bunch of bit manipulations, and then write me one that decodes that as well. And now I can just use that for my communications and all my strings and everything like that, and it does all the work for you. So th we, uh, I saw this in there, and then in addition, I couldn't get it to Beacon. I couldn't get this malware to actually reach out. And so what I did was I found the command loop, and I worked backwards from it and saw, okay, all right, this is where it's going, and this is how it gets to the command loop, and then I ran into this. So there was a, f a function that basically said, all right, generate a random number, and whatever that number is, okay, if it's, you know, one, sleep for a little bit, two, um, create some threads, wait for them to complete, and those threads are gonna go do some random other crap, like do some math functions that take a while or other stuff. And so it, it would generate a random number and it, would, it was basically a state machine. It was moving through and based on that random number, it would move to the next level if it hit, in this case, if it hit three, it's gonna go to the next level, which then had another level and another level and another. So by the power of math, they eventually would execute their command loop but the ch odds of it executing in a timely fashion if you run it once are basically in impossible. It will, it will take forever just because it's doing all kinds of clever sleep things in order um, to avoid you going through this. So you act, in order to get this to Beacon, I had to actually force it down all the right code paths. And like this is a gross underestimation of the number of, of code paths that they had created. It was a disgusting huge state machine. And once again, I'm pretty sure that they programmatically generated this. They wrote something that wrote um, this C code for them that would just make this disgusting state machine that it would hopefully, it would eventually get through. No telling when, but it will eventually take a command from the C2. So really interesting and a, a real pain if you actually want to run it and get some traffic or stuff like that. So that was pretty impressive. Um, we're actually re working on a blog post, so this is my shame, shameless plug. This is an APT3 backdoor I was just describing. And um, I'm working on this with Robert Falcone, and it'll be out in a, hopefully a week or so. And finally, the last sample I want to talk about was this, this service that was installed on, on, poil, on point of sale systems. So it was, this ev it was this evil looking service. It had a random file name, and what it did was it was a packed kernel driver. So when it ran, it would run, unpack itself, and then inject into user land processes. So it would inject shell code into these user land processes. And then on purpose, it would actually crash. So uh, when you go and you look at this computer, you don't see that service running anymore. It's not actually still running. All you have is these infected user land processes that are doing the malicious work for them. It was really impressive because if anybody's reversed kernel level stuff, it's a pain. And packing in kernel level stuff is even worse. So it's a real pain to reverse this. So it was a nice, really nice piece of malware. However, it was hidden on the system as a seven character string, a random seven character string dot sys file that was unsigned, which is great. Most, driver, most people that write kernel drivers sign their stuff because it takes a lot of work and they sign them. They, the, like I said, the file name was a random character string. The service name was that random character string. And then the service description was Microsoft, the character string, and support. Uh, I, I don't know about all companies, but Microsoft signs most of their crap, like almost everything. So all of that stuck out really bad. So we weren't really sure if they were trolling with this or just kind of dumb. 
And then finally, what they were really doing at the end of this was wrapping a .NET string copy function and then regexing that for credit card numbers. So all of this work, all of this packed kernel driver that seriously would have been hundreds of man hours worth of work, um, this is their end goal, is just regexing a .NET binary for, um, for credit card numbers. However, .NET is really easy to decompile. You can decompile it and recompile it with almost no effort most of the time. So you could either have an unsigned kernel driver that looks really suspicious, or you can just recompile this binary. And at this point, it was kind of the decision of the malware team I was working with that these are basically dog scientists that have no idea what they're doing. with <laughs> So anyways, um, next I want to talk a little bit about you know, some of the ways that you can write better malware. Because like they, these are, there's some simple things that you can do to make my life a little more miserable. And then on top of that, these are good uh, tips just for like if you have something that you're writing and you want to protect it so that somebody can't reverse engineer it, crack it, get, um, get something out of it that you don't want them to get, follow some of the, these things because they will help you in blocking somebody from doing that. So first, if you're writing C, just use if defs. They're really easy to use, and they do a good job of stopping me from getting what I want. Like, if the whole usage thing that I described at the beginning of the story and all of the debugging strings, if you wrap them in if defs, really easy to stop me from being able to see them because at compile time, when you actually compile the one you want to release, just switch the if def and I won't see any of it. So, really simple. Next. Why not just like put in a fake usage? Like put in something that says, okay, the usage is the same, it copy and pasted from ping. Like that, that's a decent thing that would probably trip me up a little bit for a second. I mean, it's it, just a little thing that you could do that would tr um, change, you know, what somebody thought that binary was. Next, um, you can do stuff where you're really messing with me. Like pre-deployment, you can have all your debugging strings in there, but you can also put fake debugging strings in later that are all for like when you're actually releasing it, so they all look ridiculous. Why not? Go for it. Next, don't do stuff like this. Don't use user agent strings that are like, well, I'm writing malware, so my user agent string is malware 666, yeah. Like, that's a bad idea. We're probably going to sig it, and you're never going to get through with it again. So don't do that, and look for this kind of stuff. So when you compile with Visual Studio, you're going to have um, project strings in there. If your project string is super awesome backdoor, oh my god, yeah, we're going to probably say, all right, well, if you see that again, it's probably the same guy. Pretty easy. Next, how many people know how XOR works? Yay. So XOR is just like an invertible math function. If you XOR A with B, you get C. If you XOR C with B, you would then get A back. Like, it just reverses. However, it's a terrible way to hide information. A basic XOR like this is really, really terrible for hiding information. And I have a proof of concept of this. How many people know what a threat butt is? This is a threat butt. And if you take a threat butt and you XOR it with YOLO threat, you still get a threat butt. It's still there. So stop XORing your stuff. There's better ways to hide your information. Next, like. You can, uh, there's easy things that you can use out there. You can use mainstream crypto. It works really well. It does the job. It's a little bit more detectable because mainstream crypto uses very detectable patterns in terms of like S boxes and all of the, the structures that it uses. But it's still better than, you know, single byte XORing all of your stuff and thinking you're secure. Um, or write custom encoding. So write something like what I was describing, that program that generated a custom encoding and decoding. That's great. That's really tough to reverse and write something that will that will um, take care of that encoding for me. So, doing stuff like that, not too hard and really worth your while if you're trying to protect your data. Next, use packers that are out there. Um, if you've ever used the MIDA or VM Protect, they are both terrible to reverse. VM, these both actually create a single process virtual machine that inter like that changes the byte codes that are in the binary and then at runtime interprets those new bytecodes that aren't x86 anymore and turns them back into x86. It's a huge pain to reverse this because it's going back and forth from the interpreter the whole time. Really painful to work with. So that, and like I said, use mainstream crypto. Don't write your own crypto. Bad ideas. Um, next, don't use C and C sharp. C, if you go and you reverse it, it's 
it compiles really cleanly and it, re it will decompile really easily with hex rays most of the time. It's really easy to reverse, especially if you're not, C doesn't have, you know, all of the object oriented stuff that make it difficult to reverse like C++ and things. So, so stop using C. C sharp is even worse. It actually pretty much inherently decompiles so you can throw it into reflector or IL spy and you just get source code back. So it's really easy to reverse. So I mean, we, we all can read source code if we can reverse engineer. So stop doing that. Use stuff like this. Use Delphi. Delphi is old and terrible and really painful to reverse. If you want to write something that you want to protect, put it in Delphi because nobody will want to touch it. It's like the plague for reversers. We all hate it. C++ with like object-oriented stuff, start passing around function pointers and doing all that kind of stuff. Everything goes through jump tables and we have to write a bunch of structures and it's a big pain. That's, it's a great way to protect some of your stuff. And then Golang, if, has anybody written any stuff in Golang? Nice, great. Golang is great. It puts all kinds of interesting stuff in there that make it really complicated to reverse. It compiles to native, but it doesn't look anything like what C compiles to. It does all kinds of other stuff. So it's um, a really great one because it'll throw us a curveball. Next, like obviously encode or encrypt your data, like hide your communications. So if I see Wartel's pewter, like Windows 7, I'm like, oh, well, it's telling, you know, it's command and control server what my specs are. You know, if, if I see a string that doesn't have that in it, it's going to be a little less obvious until I actually get that um, decoded. And then use some interesting ones, like use Twitter or WordPress for your comms. Don't have a C2 server. Make, like, all of these public uh, companies do the work for you. That's totally a possibility. And some of the cooler malware that I've seen will do some stuff like this, where it'll go through Google calendars or Yahoo or stuff like that. So. And finally, just be a little more more clever. Use multiple network protocols. There's no, there's nothing that says that you can't every time just switch and have your C2 checking on multiple protocols while you're doing the same thing at the client side. Nothing that says you can't do that. And use dynamic DNS. It's painful, and most of the people that are like most of the people that are using DGAs right now aren't doing that good of a job of it. So do that kind of stuff. Um, also, troll a little. Hide in like some similar code. Like put some stuff in there that doesn't make any sense with, uh, compared to what you actually want to do, because that's a really good way of you know protecting your stuff and stopping somebody from using it, or from reversing it and stealing it. Um, yeah. And then finally, write modular malware. Like I was saying about that downloader, uh, if your malware downloads something from a C2 and that C2 is down by the time I actually get it. I don't know what it really does. It just downloads something and then executes it. I really have no idea what its actual end goal is. So do that kind of stuff. Or write a rootkit backdoor. Rootkits are harder to reverse. They're harder to write, I, I'll admit, but they are a lot harder to reverse. Or write a BIOS backdoor that communicates via sound waves, because apparently that's possible now. So do that stuff. Um, and like I said earlier, write code that writes code. It's a great way to do this. I've, for a lot of the CTF challenges that I write, I really like writing Python that writes C for me because I like writing Python and I don't like writing C that much. So I write a lot of Python that does all the work for me. Um, it's great ways to do stuff like that. And then finally, just stop being lazy coders is the biggest thing. Like You can get a job done faster, but if you need to protect something, you have to do a little bit of this, this kind of work in order to protect it because there are so many reversing tools out there and there's so much stuff. Like this guy and, uh, is gonna write some lazy code and I'm gonna be able to reverse it really easily. So this is for malware or for whatever you're writing that you need to protect. So it's just important to, uh, to take some of this into mind. And you may be wondering like, why am I all right talking about this and saying like, hey, here's how to write better malware and how to pr better protect your software. In the end, it's not going to matter that much because at the, on the other side of things, there's always a human in front of a computer that's going to double click a PDF and this crap is just going to keep happening, at least for the foreseeable future. So this is just good advice for if you want to protect your things. And you may wonder, like, if Fran's life was so hard and she went through so much, you know, why would she want to be in the APTs? And this is about the only reason I can come up with. So with that, I will take questions. <laughs> mm -hmm. What? No. <laughs>
And I'm not above bribery, and we have too much beer, so if you ask a question, I have t-shirts generously donated from Salesforce and beers generously donated from me that you can have one of either of them if you ask a question. They're cold, I promise, because it's hot here. <laughs> I have not, but I do keep hearing sounds that scare me. <laughs> I'll, I'll, happily, I just don't own one. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> if you have one on you, I'll take it for my next talk, OK? <laughs> that deserves a beer if you want one. <laughs> yeah, come and grab it. Yep. <laughs> Work a little harder for me. Now. I, I'm looking for creativity if you're going to pull that one. <laughs> that guy gets a beer. <laughs> Sorry, guy at the back? Uh, so when you say is it art or science, can you say what you mean by that exactly? Like, is it, are, are they cl really clever, or is it just that they're willing to do the hard work? Is that what you mean? Yeah, uh, it, it's, it's kind of both, I would say. Um, a big piece of it is willingness to do the hard work. Like, I've written some kernel software, and it's a pain. Like, it's a lot harder, but that's, it's a hell of a lot harder to detect, and it's a lot, e like, it's, it works really well if you can do it. And also, if anybody's seen it, there's um, guys giving talks on BIOS malware now that not, not the one that goes over the sound waves, but like actual BIOS malware that's really awesome and does some really clever things. Like, that's an even farther level down that's really painful. So those parts of it are like the hard engineering task. But parts, the other part is, to what you were saying, it's a little bit of artwork and creativity. You have to have something behind you that says, OK, well, if I want to mess with somebody and I don't want them to be able to understand this, how do I do it? And that part's less about like the capabilities and how you implement it. It's more about like how you're willing to, how clever you can get with manipulating bytes and hiding stuff in places that it shouldn't be. I would say that that's the art piece. And you get a beer if you would like, sir, or a shirt. Uh, well, I mean, it depends on who you are, obviously. So, I mean, if I'm in the APTs, I would reverse it and then I would reuse it for my own nefarious purposes, probably. But if, you know, if you're talking about somebody that works for an IR company, they're going to reverse it, find all of the artifacts that it's going to drop, all of the network communications. They're going to look for all of these things. So, like I was saying, IOCs or indicators of compromise is one kind of threat intel format that a lot of people use. And they're just going to pull out of that information, and then they're going to use it to protect themselves from that sample in the future. Obviously, there's a little bit of fuzziness, because a clever malware author is going to write things where they'll be like, OK, well, once in a while, I'll just randomly communicate with Google. And then if you automatically generate an IOC, you've just blocked Google for your whole company. Like, the stuff like that is a little more clever. But um, yeah, th that's what's going to be used. Um, by country is really difficult um, because attribution is a really hairy game and actually pulling it off is really difficult. But um, I can say that like the groups that are tracked that I've, that I've seen, definitely, I mean, certain ones are much more advanced and certain ones, they all have their kind of, I think it's TTPs, tool, uh, tactics, tools, and practices. Um, some of them will use, for example, there's one APT group that loves Delphi and I hate them. They're terrible. Um, there's one APT group that really loves web shells, and they will pretty much do an entire um, attack with almost entirely web shells. They don't drop any actual malware. Some of the, so they have like different approaches, and they have, like I said, different skill sets. More recently, we, um, I saw a sample that was it actually, like when you do QA on a piece of software, like in an actual like software engineering environment, 
you actually kind of leave remnants that let, that show that you know there were other code paths and we've done some QA and we fixed things up here. You and um, we actually saw a backdoor that had all of the remnants of like this is a they're actually like doing the full QA process on this backdoor and on this piece of software. So they're treating it like we're a, we're a dev shop and we need to like follow the right practices of deving this correctly. So. It all depends, and then some of them are just like absolute crap, and they're doing really silly things. Like, um, I know that my story is very exaggerated and slightly ridiculous and full of Barbies, but every single one of those examples is stuff that I have seen in APT malware. That's all stuff that happens regularly, like not not uncommonly. The the debugging strings kind of stuff and all of that so common, and it just makes our lives really easy. Like they the um, the APT groups that are willing to clean up after themselves are the ones that are a little scarier. Like APT3 that I mentioned, they do a good job of cleaning up. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Is there a question? <laughs> yeah. 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 I've never dealt with the spoofing phone call stuff. I have had some coworkers get some of them come in because, you know, I work for security companies, so we get attacked a lot. And so most of the time it's like, oh, this is lulzy. They just tried this again and it didn't work, but it gave, they gave us another piece of malware, so that was nice of them. Like, nobody executed it, but we have it now, so. It won't get in again, that's for sure. Um, all of you guys that ask questions, come grab beers, grab shirts, whatever you want. What do you mean by sources? Oh, um, so previously I was at Mandiant and um, doing uh, IR at Mandiant. Some of these examples were from investigations there. Um, I can give like small pieces of code that, <laughs> that don't show anything about who the client was or anything like that without talking about that. But um, most of the time, it's from investigations. I, I work at Palo Alto Networks doing reversing now, and the, we have so many clients and so much data that we, ha we have. I think uh, when I go through our like big data solution and I'm searching through malware samples, I'm looking at 400 million samples that I can like go and run searches against. Uh, sorry, not malware. Uh, samples that are going through of those, not all uh, like 10% are malware, and then I get into. That's a lot of data that I can go and sift through and play around with. So um, the the last ones that I was ref uh, referring to, the APT3 stuff, that's all from just a client happens to have these and a CVE happened and we saw the attacks happen and now we're just pulling out stuff. So. It, uh, it depends. I mean, some of them I would say, you know, sometimes there's like, um, a managed defense group or like a certain place that has blocked them, but then we still get access to them. So like they get caught in quarantine, but you know, they still go in for analysis and we can still play around with them and have them. So not all of them get through, but like a lot of the ones that come from an, an investigation are always going to be, you know, post-mortem because like sometimes you're, you're doing an investigation and there's been a group in there for seven years because nobody knows what they're doing in the security for that team or for that company. So like, you know, you get in there sometimes, and yeah, the malware's been there for a long time, and it's just regularly beaconing once in a while until they get what they want. <laughs> um, it all depends on what you want out of it. So um, it depends on what you're doing. If you're doing like long-term research and analysis, that takes longer. If you if you want to write down all the capabilities of this malware and everything, so like the blog post that I'm going to be pushing out, I break down the whole command loop and every single command and what it does, and then I compare it to other samples that are the sa obviously the same code base, but they've kind of evolved a little bit. That kind of stuff takes time. I mean, I think I've probably spent maybe 20 hours reversing samples for that stuff. However, a lot of the times you're under a gun and you have, you're like, all right, we need to know. It's like kind of like good versus bad. And you just have to be like, is this evil? Yes or no? And 
you figure out is it evil and hopefully you know some capabilities of it. So sometimes you want it to be less than an hour that you spend on it. So it, it really all depends on who's asking really. So um, IR teams are going to spend as short amount of time because they're under a gun. You know they have a client with X amount of money every single time and they don't <laughs> they don't want to burn through their money and not be able to get the answers. So. Um, they're going to want it as fast as possible. You know, to do good research, it takes longer. So, yeah. Well, he still only gets one beer, so it's okay. <laughs> uh, yep. Sure. Um, it depends, it, like he was asking, it depends on the groups. Some groups will never use it because they've just never learned it apparently. Um, some groups use it constantly. Um, I don't mention it in what I talked about, but the one with uh, the APT3 backdoor I was referencing, they like to do anti-disassembly tricks, but they have one. They apparently have figured out one and only one. So uh, part of the blog post will be an IDA Pro script yeah, that's just like, okay, if you see these instructions, fix it up and like even go and recreate the functions for you and it does all the work for you. So um, sometimes they're much more clever and they will do ridiculous heavy stuff. I can't give you numbers whatsoever because I can't speak to that, but you definitely see all of it. The one thing I will say is anti-VM stuff is really going away in targeted malware because most of the time they, um, they will still want to, you know, some, people are keeping their their very crucial uh, resources and thing, uh, their IP and stuff in virtualized environments now. So if you say write malware that doesn't execute inside of a VM, it's not going to execute in where you want possibly and that's not good. So anti-VM is kind of going away. Anti-debugging uh, where you're like checking to see if somebody's debugging. That stuff all the time, like most of the time really basic. They don't do stuff like timing checks very regularly. They'll be like, all right, is debugger present? okay, don't do stuff, and then they don't do stuff, and, and I laugh, and I keep doing, <laughs> seeing what it's doing, but sometimes they're putting in a lot of good checks in there, but anti-disassembly is the one that's most, you know, the biggest pain, I would say. I would say um, also, most of the time, they're just doing encoding, like, kind of their anti-reversing, anti-everything is just, hey, if it's encoded a couple times, it'll be fine, nobody will get through that, and obviously, yeah, 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 exactly. Or just like a, a couple of times hitting F4 in a debugger. <laughs> like, yeah, got it. And drinks, shirts, whatever you'd like, sir. Um, any more questions? Thank you very much. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yes, definitely. Um, yeah, uh, APTs don't like when you talk about them, apparently. So um, I was at Mandiant when the APT1 report came out, and <laughs> the best thing was, one, they trojanized the APT1 report and then tried to re-release it, and then they also actively targeted it. So that, that was one fun thing. Um, they actively targeted Mandiant employees right after that with terribly written PDFs similar to the one that I showed. And none of that got through. It's pretty hilarious. It was like, thanks for the malware. We now have all the IOCs from all of this, but you didn't get anything from us. Um, and then the other one I will say is uh, there's a piece of uh, ransomware, and I forget what the name of it is, but it's ransomware that, you know, like crypto, well, not like CryptoLocker, but some of the other ransomwares that are like, we've locked your computer. We're the FBI or the CIA or the NSA. And you've been looking at child porn and you're going to prison for 10 years unless you pay us $300. Like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, and get your money back and yeah, all of that. Um, the, be the best part about the one I'm uh, talking about is that it had this banner that was like, <laughs> it had NSA, CIA, the Mandiant logo, and then it had like Obama pointing at you. <laughs> yeah. Pretty great, um, and so we definitely see that a lot. It's just, you know, the media explodes sometimes, <laughs> sometimes like, man, it's trying to attack you, which is obviously not true, but yeah, stuff like that happens. Any more questions? All right, thank you very much. It's awesome being here.